I invite you to turn to your bulletin to the call to the water.
meeting tonight or no? Yes, JPF meeting at six. Okay. Um, this uh, season of Lent, we gave kids these little um, containers to fill with uh, coins related to uh, ways in which they can uh, be grateful uh, for the resources that they have at home as a way to help uh, fill the food pantry here. If you are interested in getting one of those containers, we have some in the uh, Narthex uh, slash lobby. Uh, and so you can take those home. I know that people who've looked at the lists of things to be thankful for and grateful for has been a really spiritually um, uh, a uh, helpful thing to, to be a part of, so we invite you to, to uh, take one of those if you'd like to. And now I invite uh, Peggy Ferrana up to speak about one great hour of sharing. Thanks, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Around the world, gifts given by the United Church of Christ communities to one great hour of sharing we are a tapestry of faith, hope, and love in action. We are grateful for the opportunity to change the world through our acts of kindness, large and small. The tapestry we weave includes our being present with communities near and far, following various kinds of disasters, assisting communities with the resources they need to survive, or helping children with educational needs. Yet, we could not be in all places or even see them on our own, with our own eyes. But through our generous gifts, we can show that love remains in spirit of all obstacles. Let us give joyfully and generously in that spirit. A special offering will be collected next Sunday, March the 19th. Envelopes will be in your pew and may be put in the offering plate or brought to the church office. The Christian Outreach Ministry thanks you for your generosity. Now we would like to take a moment to recognize uh, Hannah and Davey. Um, so I'll invite you guys to come on up. So the national setting of the United Church of Christ's Environmental Justice Ministry had an art contest. Contestants were asked to create a piece of art um, around the topic of climate hope, uh, environmental justice, or protecting the earth. Senior Pilgrim Fellowship uh, sent in submissions along with almost 900 kids from around the country uh, from over 270 churches. And Hannah and Davey were chosen as finalists. Uh, so we celebrate their work and hope for a healthy future. And now I invite everyone to greet uh, those around you with signs of God's peace and hope for the future. For those who are able Please to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In God's hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are God also. Oh, that today you would listen to God's voice. <clears throat> Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day as Massa in the wilderness. When your ancestors tested God, though they had seen God's work. You may be seated.
Sorry, no. That's not it. Please stand. Join me in our unison prayer of confession printed in your bulletins. Enduring presence, we confess that sometimes we question if you are among us or not. Sometimes we quarrel with you when we are tested. These are the moments when our outlook needs transformation. You are gracious in looking beyond our faults to see our needs and meet them. Thank you for your immeasurable grace. Amen. New mercies are granted daily, and every day we have an opportunity to be changed forever and for good. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free to live new lives in the shadow and in the light of God's grace through Jesus Christ. So thanks be to God, and amen. You may be seated. Earlier, Ward, the liturgist, called us to worship using the words from Psalm 95 from the Bible. Back in the day, a worship leader would have called people together to worship, which calls us to come together and others call us to worship. Maybe a friend invited you to come or you and saw the sign or you got an email reminder or a live stream pop up on your calendar. We have responded to the call because we're here. And some of you even changed your clocks and good job. Today we have a chance to think about the ministry of the deacons who are responsible for uh, the worship and spiritual life of our congregation along with the pastors. So I invite our helpers to uh, get in their, in their places, and I, th I think you guys just did that. Thank you. 
Uh, and you're going to be moving to places in the sanctuary where special ministry happens. And so if you're in one of those places, I'd love for you to hold up your sign. Sadie, yeah, there you go. Hold your sign up. Uh, and these are just a few of the places of special ministry. Uh, we have pew, narthex, balcony, chancel, and pulpit. And now I'm going to invite children who might be in the, in the sanctuary with us. I'm going to invite you to move to one of those places with a sign and uh, helpers there uh, that interests you. Maybe it's the, the back doors over there. Or maybe it's up in the balcony. Maybe you've never been there. Or maybe it's in this really cool pew right here. Or maybe it's up on the chancel with these, two, uh, these three ladies. Or maybe it's up in the pulpit. That's a really cool spot. So if any kids want to move to those places, make your way there. Oh, he's in the balcony too, but the sign's over there. Thank you. You, you go up the, through the narthex and up the stairs. Nice. Very cool. No, nobody wants to be in the pew? They were there already. They were just there. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Great. As you make your way, um, I would direct everyone's attention uh, to the back of the sanctuary where Jim and Dina are there. When we get to church, people greet us at the front doors, and then ushers give us a worship bulletin before we find our seat in a pew. Many of us appreciate hearing the music as we enter. It draws us in. Deacons and volunteers come early to get the church ready for you. We turn the lights on and the sound system. We open the doors. We get the flowers set in the chancellor. We get the bulletins to give out. Then we welcome when you arrive because hospitality is an important to our worship experience. Maybe you were thirsty for a warm hello when you came to worship. Awesome. And now I invite you to direct your attention to Karen and Tyler in the pew. When my family comes to church, we usually sit over there somewhere uh, where we sit impacts our worship experience. Some people choose the exact same place each Sunday and, other, and others move around for different perspectives. A long time ago, church members had assigned seats. That's why you see numbers on some of the pews. From your pew, you can use all your senses to drink and worship and fellowship. We listen from the pews. We pray here. We sing from hymnals that live in the pew rocks in front of you. We make pew connections by greeting our neighbor, neighbors, passing the communion trays as we did last Sunday, or passing the offering plates. These might not be the most comfortable seats, but maybe that's good because worship, in worship we participate. So we are already on the edge of our seats to respond to God's word. Thank you. And now I invite you to direct your attention to the balcony. Some of us come to worship through beautiful music. In our call to worship, we are reminded to make a joyful noise to God. And that happens when our bell choir plays up here or when you sing from, from your pew way over there under the wall plaque for Rev. Basile Pinillo. I bet some of you have a favorite hymn of thanksgiving or praise. Music can help us open our senses to be ready for worship. So Adam, Ashley, and Wang Jung talk about worship and music together. Music and the hymns we sing might tell us the Bible story in a new way. It might reveal something about who God is. It might allow us to share our gifts, and it might give us the words or feeling to express our love or need or gratitude or sadness or joy. Music, like water, has power to wash over us, to fill us, to lift us up. And now lift your gaze up to the pulpit with Cooper and Patty. We hear sermons from the pulpit and scripture readings. In our church tradition, God's word is very important. So the congregation who design, designed this worship space a long time ago lifted up where the word of God would be shared. It was also really practical so that the both people on the floor level and those sitting in the balcony could hear. And it's pretty cool up here. 
As deacons, we are responsible for worship in the spiritual life of First Church's people. Understanding that each of us comes to church thirsty, we believe that God's good news has the power to meet us in our needs. So maybe one person hears the story of a woman at the well and appreciates how Jesus asks for water to drink, human like us. And another person hears the same story but appreciates the part where Jesus tells the woman he is the living water, and if she knew he was God, she would be asking him for something to drink. As deacons, we light the candles before worship. It represents a call to worship, and there are two because it represents that Jesus is both human and God. Amen. And now I invite you to direct your attention to our chancel crew. You guys can stand up. Lots of worship happens up here. We hear children messages. Baptisms happen here using the baptismal bowl that is in the baptism font that you passed on your way in. Communion is served from this table after deacons set up the trays with juice and prepare the bread to share. Offering plates are given and received here. Many pe people are married here and exchange vows. We rehearsed for and shared the Christmas pageants here. Many of us remember that. Prayer leaders speak from the lectern there. Members of the congregation give flowers for worship here in honor or memory of loved ones. Important worship happens here. Memorial services are shared when a loved one dies. New members covenant with the church here. Confirmands kneel here and receive a blessing when they confirm their faith. We learn about all sorts of new stuff here. The ministry of our deacons and the church body as we come together for worship is abundant. And this is just a drop in the bucket of all that happens to call us to worship on Sunday mornings. Hopefully it has given you new perspective on what happens when we worship together. Made you curious to know more about things like the stained glass window back there. Or why the walls look pink and sometimes. Or maybe you see where you might like to join in ministry. You can ask any of the deacons at coffee hour. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, directs the psalmist, so let us pray. <clears throat> Thank you, God, for the space to worship. Like so many of your people over the past 384 years, thank you for those who call us to worship, who welcome us, who guide us, and share your good news that we carry with us when we leave. Thank you for the way you bless each of us with love and power to support the worship of your people. Amen. I invite our children to Sunday school. God gives of God oh God gives of God's self freely so let us give freely to God let us bring gifts that sustain the life of the kingdom of the kingdom may these resources be more than enough amen
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Fount of blessing, receive our gifts in the joy that we give them. Be it time, tithe, or talent, it all comes from you. Thank you for blessing us to be a blessing to you and each other. Amen. In our Old Testament story, the Israelites haven't been in the wilderness that long, but they have our challenges. Listen to Exodus 17, verses 7 through 1. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Repidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do for this people? So they, all, so they are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Now take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? In our New Testament story from John chapter 4, Jesus breaks all sorts of barriers. He's heading back to Galilee when we hear. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samarian city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob has given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Would you pray with me? Holy God, bless our thirst with your word. Amen. Our passages today make me thirsty. Give us a drink, Moses. From Psalm 95, remember the rock of our salvation and Mesa and Merid, Meribah in the desert. Even Jesus takes a break by Jacob's well in the heat of the day. Tired from his long journey, presumptuously he asks a Samaritan woman, Will you give me a drink? Thirst makes me wonder where the water will come from. We had a well. Where did your water come from when you were growing up? I didn't worry so much about water unless the pump stopped occasionally. But even that wasn't a big deal. My dad could go to the pump house, reprime, restart, and magic. Water flowed. Water flowed where I grew up, similar to Milford, right? With water fountains in schools, we didn't carry around personal water bottles. Imagine. We had creeks, reservoirs, rivers, springs, and waterfalls, even a huge gorge and hydroelectric dams. 
plenty of water for gardens, immersion baptisms, and boating. I was excited to study Georgia's rivers during college. The waters near Athens teemed with fish and mussels and water striders. North Georgia rivers even taught me about hypothermia when my kayak dumped me into the water. Lessons learned. Don't hold on to branches. Go with the flow. Water is powerful. We learn about the importance of water. Microbiology opened my eyes to water purification. Because of backpacking, I learned the importance of carrying fresh water, a water pump, iodine tablets, a backup pump, all to purify water. But for some reason, I started to worry about accessing water if, for instance, you are out in the wilderness for extended periods of time, say, lost. And especially if you are responsible for making sure that others have enough to drink. With great adventure comes great responsibility. I dabbled in survivalist techniques in camp ministry, like using a tarp over a hole with a bowl in there to collect condensation. Unsuccessful, as was the solar oven. Don't try it. That's probably why I started packing so much water, like two gallons. Do the math. A gallon of water is 8.34 pounds. I packed in water, despite the likelihood that in the lush landscape of the southeast, you're liable to find a spring bubbling up from a rock outcropping or cross a creek 20 times on the same trail. I don't know if, number one, I mistrust mappers who noted water sources but failed to disclose must wade through 30 yards of stinging nettles to reach out-of-reach water source. Or, number two, I didn't trust the landscape or myself. Or, number three, I just fear thirst. Whatever, I packed lots of water. Then I moved to the Sierra Nevada mountains. Guess what? It's dry. Except for right now, they are inundated with snow. But water sources there are less reliable. Life had thicker skin. Animals and plants grew thorns and horns and adapted to make do with less. I met an old hiker on the Tahoe Rim Trail who said he only ever carried one quart of water. What trust, what confidence. It made me thirsty watching that wizened man drink his half-empty Nalgene, wondering if he knew where he would next fill that bottle. Later, it occurred to me he was on his own. No one relied on him for their next drink, and he was hiking for leisure, not trying to get out of the wilderness, not trying to survive. So I sympathize with those Israelites. They were thirsty, and thirst begets thirst, even if part of it is a psychological thirst. After Moses let the waters crash down over those Egyptian pursuers, the Israelites anxiously make their way through the wilderness of Shur, and guess what? It's dry. And they grew up in Goshen, which was fertile near the Nile River with all its tributaries. So dreams of home on the delta may just fade away there in the desert of sin. Freedom is not milk and honey like they had heard. There is no way to carry all that they need, especially not all the water they need. Murmuring starts. And I can guarantee you I would have been murmuring with them. We're thirsty, Moses. Ah, this stuff tastes like metal, Moses. Our bread ran out, Moses. We're hungry, Moses. This is boring, Moses. How much further, Moses? Why do we got to take the long way around, Moses? Did God abandon us, Moses? Multiply those complaints by 600,000. Thirst saps morale. If you read the whole story... 
God meets every challenge. It is remarkable. They worry over whether God is around. Boo, God. Then they get a cloud by day and a fire by night. Yay, God. They're thirsty near Mara. Boo, God. They find a source. Yay, God. But the source is undrinkable. Boo, God. So Moses consults God, turns that bitter water sweet. Yay, God. They are hungry. Boo, God. God provides manna and quail, enough for each day. Yay, God! Relief lasts until the next frustration springs up. Now they've been wandering around sin, and they stop at a place, a rest stop, called Rephidim, which means rest stop. But there's no water. And three days later, there's still no water, and the nagging devolves from, I'm thirsty, to Moses, how could you? To, is the Lord even among us or not boo god physical to psychological to spiritual thirst the quarrelsome wilderness generation makes an assumption that seems quite natural and universal writes frederick nider when they have what they need and want they believe god is with them yay god in times of hunger thirst and affliction they deem themselves abandoned by god Boo, God. Now, FYI, Mr. Nider did not add those yays and boos. That was self-inflicted. Enough yays sound like praise, right? Enough boos point to crisis. The crisis is real. Thirst makes me wonder where the water will come from. One out of every four people around the world lack safe drinking water. Two billion people, according to the United Nations. War exacerbates uh, water scarcity in Africa and the Middle East. People are thirsty. Maybe you have been moved by images of women and children walking for miles to get to a water source that is no more than a mud hole. Then they carry filled jerry cans back home. Do the math. 40 pounds of water. Wonder with me about water in Ukraine, battered by Russian assault. Where is the water coming from for Pakistan after flooding last year continues to devastate the population? How long will it take to rebuild damaged water and sanitation systems in Turkey and Syria where survivors urgently need safe drinking water and water for cleaning and medical care and latrines? Where does your water come from? Don't say the faucet. Many of us don't know. We take it for granted because of access and abundance. Look out the window. Others know too well. Water stress can drive desperation. Water stress in the United States drains the trust of communities like those in Jackson, Mississippi, in Flint, Michigan, in East Palestine, Ohio, reeling after the chemical spill or from a rusty infrastructure, or failure among leaders and dangerous neglect, particularly impacting communities of color. We murmur. We need water, which is why threats to water sources rile humans up and make us murmur. Humans start to grow metaphorical thorns and and thick skin to adapt after broken trust for the scarcity of safe water they assume in times ahead. People are thirsty, and a case of bottled water won't touch their need for a shower, for justice, for trust in creation and leadership to be renewed, for faith in a system that failed them. A humanitarian crisis can spiral into a faith crisis like that. The daunting nature of Moses' question surfaces in the context of the world's water crisis. What are we to do for those people who are thirsty? 
Moses sounds halfway between servant leader and self-preservationist when he says, Lord, what am I to do for these people? They are ready to stone me. He's got skin in the game, right? These are his people. He must be panicking from all the booze. Who wouldn't be with that much responsibility? The magnitude of that crisis. Still, the flow has been established in the story as God tries to uh, nurture trust among the people. The people talk to Moses, and Moses prays or complains or pleads to God, and God provides for the people over and over again. The flow is established. God says, I will go before you. Bring that trusty staff, Moses. I'll stand in front of the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock. Water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses becomes an instrument. Water flows. The thirsty drink. Yay, God! The rock of our salvation. Their trust is restored for the moment. Instead of naming the place, do I need to pull the car over, Moses chose Meribah, which means Israel quarreled. And on the map, he wrote in Massa, which means where they tested God in case they were to wander there again. Thirst is predictable. The Israelites journey through a dry and weary land, so guess what? Doubt, like thirst, finds them again as it finds us. Just like our need for water, they would again and again thirst for assurance of God's presence with them to know that they were not alone. Just like our need for water, they needed regular reminders to get ahead of the thirst. And they would call the community together for worship. And they would retell the family story about where they had been. They would recount who they know God to be. Rock of our salvation, maker, provider, listener. They would share how God is evident in the world. They would care for one another. They would remind each other where the water comes from. And all of that could quench their spiritual thirst. John's gospel makes it clear that we are dealing with physical water and spiritual water for our thirst. Water, water, and living water. As a faith community now, at in pews and a roof, we are still following this practice of calling each other to come to the waters to meet our spiritual thirst. We gather to reprime that well that maybe stopped flowing, to be filled. Here, the living water we receive reconstitutes our compassion for all people. Thirsty people wander among us out in the world and at school and at work, in parades. Thirsty people sit in our church pews, writes Terry McDowell Ott. We all thirst at some point for healing or hope, a miracle for forgiveness, for friendship or a strategic plan or answers or peace or just help. Thank God that wherever we fall on that thirst scale, we have these faith practices to remind us, come to the waters, thirsty people. Come and sing about our formative times and remember how God made water flow from the rock. The flow of living water opens our ears to the cries and murmurs of those who thirst for the water water. So here's your challenge. March the 22nd is World Water Day. It's a day to raise awareness and inspire action to tackle the global water and sanitation crisis. There's a link in your bulletin with a cool picture and a QR code. From a place of thanksgiving for the blessing of water in our lives, which I bet all of you can name, even as you leave the church today and see the beautiful waterfall, from that place of joy and gratitude, 
Number one, take time to learn about where water comes from for others. And number two, take action, small or grand, to make sure that those who thirst will have water that flows. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I invite Adam, Patty. God, we thirst for your presence amid loneliness and despair, for your spirit of love poured into our hearts. May all your children know that they belong, that they are loved, that they are wonderfully made. Hear our silent prayers to know your presence during suffering, O oh God. God, we give thanks for water. We ask your blessing on World Water Day. Empower people to learn and act in ways that will change the water crisis around the globe. Help us all to do our part to help to love our neighbors near and far by conserving water, preventing pollution, and protecting nature. Hear our silent prayers for those who work so hard each day to access clean water, especially those in Turkey, Syria, Ukraine, Pakistan, and in East Asia and Africa. God of life, we thirst for knowledge of you at work in our world, dispelling our doubt and uncertainty. We pray for you to right what is wrong, to banish evil, to restore order amid chaos. Turn our world towards peace, especially in Ukraine. And hear our silent prayers now to know the ways you are at work in our world, O oh God. God of hope, we thirst for healing and harmony, for an end to violence and living in fear. We pray for an end of bipartisan fighting, legislative meltdowns, and political turmoil that serves no citizen well. Fashion our world, our nation, our communities into places that reflect your peaceful kingdom where every life is valued, everyone's dignity respected. Here are silent prayers for healing and harmony, O God. In your mercy, O God, hear the prayers of your people. We pray for Peter and Marty, for Rita and Patty, for Joan and Ruth. Bless all those who have lost loved ones. We remember today the family of Walter Helensky. Help us walk with you during this Lenten season so we can learn and grow in your embrace. Help us follow in the footsteps of our Savior who offers us living water and calls on us to pray as he prayed, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
as you leave this space, remember that the God who caused water to flow from the rock is the same God who walks with you. Go forth with the assurance that in the midst of the chaotic world we live in, something good can happen, something good will happen. Go in peace. Amen.